Hey everybody, this is Detroit Bob. Uh, welcome back again to Detroit Bob, the podcast. And I'm here with my trusty sidekick, Johnny, again. Um, so we got a little bit different camera angle, so Johnny doesn't look like the mystery guest this week. You actually can see his, his face. Um, but the main thing, we're back again, and we're going to sort of pick up on something we touched on uh, last episode uh, which is the MC5 in the untimely death of Wayne Kramer. Uh, but before we do that, I think we should just go back to sort of ground zero. Um, we talk about garage bands and garage rock and proto-punk a lot, and we've hit on that the last couple episodes. But if you go before that, um, there was a hit-making machine out of Detroit, that literally was taking kids off the street in, in, in one door and then churning them out as superstars on the front end of, of that assembly line. And you know it, and we know it, and the world knows it as Motown Records. Yeah. Um, I mean, everybody in the world has heard a song um, that came out from that corporation, people don't realize they had multiple labels. They had the, the famous Motown label when you used to see on the 45s that had Detroit with a star on it and a little map. And it's red and it's got a rainbow colored Motown and block letters. But they also had a label called Gordy, which was sort of an ugly brown and yellow uh, or I'm sorry, sort of a purplish and, and then the ugly brown and yellow was, I believe it was called Tamla. And then they had Soul and uh, even a more obscure label from some of the early uh, stuff, Joe Bet. So um, let's look back at Motown and uh, what it was, what it became and how it became sort of a blueprint for these kids thinking, well, you know, I can be in a rock band. I, I can buy s some instruments and start a band. And if we get good enough, maybe we can cut a single. Um, well, we can start with the Jackson 5, probably <laughs> one of the more famous of the Motown, most well-known, I should yeah. say. Yeah. It, it, but I think what made the Jackson 5 different, I don't think the kids had that mentality that, all the other ones had. I think it was more Joe Jackson, their father, vi their father's vision. Their father's vision. In in, for a lot of us, you know, even though like you could say, well, Motown started in the late fifties, early sixties, but a lot of us missed that. So the Jackson Five was a jumping in point for a lot of people for the seventies. For the seventies, right. yeah. And um, I mean, I I still remember clearly. Of watching the Jackson Five cartoon on on television, and it was much better than the Osmonds. The Osmonds had like a competing cartoon, and you know, the Jackson Five cartoon was great, and it was it was promoting the songs, and and I was a ten year old kid watching it. Um, but you grew up in the region; um, you have to have some 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 insight from what you heard from your uncles and in uh, old neighbors and about the Jacksons and their rise to fame? Well, um, not that my father directly worked with him. He didn't, but they were both at the same factory. At the same time? Um, well, part of it, yeah. they overlapped. Yeah. Joe Jackson went on to, you know, be managed Jackson 5. Right. You know, U.S. Steel Corp., USX, should we say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, recently got sold off so i don't even know what they're called now but um yeah he you know just like everybody in gary for the most part you worked at u.s steel or one of the neighboring steel mills you know that's how he fed his family i i, I heard at the at the peak uh that steel mill employed almost thirty thousand people i think it was closer to thirty six thousand. yeah yeah so which is at the prime of yeah the and i, I think population of Gary, Indiana at one point was about 100, 110,000. Does that sound right? 
Uh, as far as the population of Gary, I'm not sure, yeah. but I mean, even the surrounding areas, you know, people can commute 20, 30, 40 minutes and right. outside of Gary, you know. So, so. You, you get, I've always said, well, Gary was a mini Detroit. Um, and I think when you look at what the, the, the melting pot that's created, when you, um, you literally open a jobs center, if you will, a, a, a factory, whether it be the Rouge plant in Detroit, where Barry Gordy worked for Motown Records, uh, U.S. Steel Corporation in Gary, Indiana, uh, where Joe Jackson worked. Um, a lot of people forget that the guys that started these bands, um, started these record labels, they had, they had jobs, like regular jobs like everybody else, at least starting out. And, um, you know, maybe, the, you know, maybe going to that job every day is at some point you get to the point where I got to get the hell out of here and I got to do something so that maybe my kids don't have to work in the factory. Yeah. Steve McQueen had the same mentality. You know, he was also a U.S. Steel Interesting. employee. Yeah. Um, so, so you get Barry, uh, Barry Gordy was the founder of Motown Records, and he is known to have started Motown uh, on a shoestring budget. Happened to uh, write a song, I think the song was Repetit for Jackie Wilson, and it soared up to, I believe, number one on the charts. Uh, and the next thing you have Smokey Robinson in, in The Miracles, The Marvelettes, Marfa Reeves and The Vandellas. The Temptations, The Four Tops, The Supremes, you know, the list goes on and on. But around 1972, there's a nine-year-old kid and his brothers out of Gary, Indiana, and he's blown away. From what I've heard, he called Michael Jackson a mini James Brown with all, with all the moves he didn't want to sign him, but he, he couldn't pass on him. I mean, could you imagine seeing a nine-year-old Michael Jackson? In, in, at that time, the, the leader of uh, probably the biggest pop record machine, record label in the United States, is, says, is basically saying, I've never seen anything like this kid. And here he is, the young, well, not the youngest son, but second the youngest son. Wasn't Randy younger than him? Remember, Randy came later, right? But Michael was, you know, nine years old with his older brothers basically rounding right. up the Jackson yeah. five. Okay, so any other stories uh, on the Jacksons? There was a distant relative that had a diner in downtown Gary. Um, I, I tried to contact somebody because it was before my time. Right, right. I tried to contact somebody today to find out the name of the diner, but uh, it's, it's long been gone by decades. Right. But uh, the the root the story I should say that yeah. was passed down yeah. was is they used to harmonize outside of the front of the diner, you know, for people to give them loose change or tips, or, yeah. and the owner of the diner would give them sweets. Yeah, just so, just li literally busking, uh, singing on the streets. Over the years of, uh, of working in 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 the region and talking to people over and over, everybody had a J a Jackson story. Oh yeah. They, they used to live down the street. Uh, what are they? They lived on, what, 2600 Jackson Street? And the name of the family is the Jacksons? Jackson. Right. So, um, and, and everybody, yeah, I went to school with Michael's oldest sister. Or, I, you know, I knew Jermaine, you know what I mean? And just visually, they were really cool. Norm and I talked about it in our uh, Detroit Bob podcast number two. He grew up in Gary. In his first concert, when he was five years old, his dad took him to the Jackson Five. And um, fast forward, um, they were signed by Motown. And uh, Barry Gordy formed a corporation. They called themselves either the company or the corporation. And their job was at that time to write songs for the Jacksons. They were the only group to have their first four songs hit number one. The first four songs out of the shoot. Beatles didn't do that. Elvis didn't do that. But the Jacksons did. So they knew, Motown knew they had something special. 
and they assigned priority number one to the Jacksons. Um, and then going forward, Norm and I touched on this in episode two, is, is uh, you know, I, I knew all the songs. I listened to all the songs. At some point, yeah, they were a little bubble gum for me. You know what I mean? And I got more interested into what uh, sort of spawned out of Motown is what we call garage rock. And the what you would probably call proto-punk of the, the, the mid-60s. And, and the scene changed and the sound changed. And fast forward to a band we mentioned earlier, the MC5, also coming out of Detroit, but a much, much different vibe, a different energy, a, a different uh, level of, I don't think Motown would have touched that band with a 10-foot pole. They did not fit what Motown was looking for your thoughts on that band and, and where they came from well i mean especially for the time the political awareness that was attached to that band whether it was something that was influenced solely by certain band members or was just the time influencing them mm -hmm. um either way you know it's just you know you would never hear anybody out of motown you know talk about the songs that Motown would put out decades prior to that. Yes. You know, there were mostly feel-good songs. Love songs. Love songs. Yeah. If they weren't, they were about heartbreak over a girl. Yeah, my girl. Uh, what was going on in the 60s by the time the MC5 came around, you know, there was a lot of political unrest in this country especially in Chicago. I think Chicago had, more, you know, some of the most televised, you know, protests. Yes. You know, other things, you know, against, you know, people that were being unfair or racist or against equality. Yes. So I think, um, you know, the MC5, even though, you know, we're talking about some white guys from Detroit. Yeah nonetheless saw all this they lived it they breathed it you know people getting sprayed with fire hoses you know things like that the um and let's be honest and there's the flip side of it where you have the narcotic you know aspect of things mm -hmm. you know drugs started becoming more and more common in this country more and more i don't want to say acceptable more and more well known which created more of a backlash and more of a push and pull. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it was Wayne Kramer who eventually got arrested for. Uh, um, I think he. I think he did some significant jail he, time. He did some serious jail time in the '70s it after was, after the MC5 was disbanded. Was disbanded. Okay, so is it fair to say that um, Barry Gordy had had great control over his artists? Up to a certain point in time, because you gotta you gotta remember later on in the seventies, and maybe this is Motown reflecting what they're hearing the MC Five do. There was, you know, what's going on by Marvin Gaye, Ball of Confusion by The Temptations, uh, Papa Was a Rolling Stone. These these were songs that were questioning, you know, societal norms, uh, questioning the Vietnam War, um, and Talking about drugs, you know, uh, psychedelic shack. And questioning authority. Questioning authority you know. and, and all of that. So um, I think MC5 was encouraged to be rebellious. They had a free reign. I know their manager, John Sinclair, was a, I would call him a 60s radical. I mean, um, I don't think anybody's going to disagree with me. I read oh, I read the no. book called Guitar Army. He was famously arrested for uh, having uh, two marijuana cigarettes joints on him. They threw him in jail. Eventually, uh, he ended up in the program at Woodstock and became a co counterculture revolutionary hero. And his he was the manager of the MC Five. 
And so, so this is all happening in, 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 in Detroit. You have the sweet sounds of, you know, Motown was built as the sound of young America. But just down the street, you have guys experimenting with drugs, just radically tearing up, not maybe literally the stage, but tearing it up sonically and musically and looking like uh, they used to say about the Rolling Stones, the kid that you don't want to bring home for dinner. <laughs> All five of them. Well, not to spin off to the British invasion, but... Yeah. You know, the Stones' whole thing were to be the anti-Beatles. Yes. I mean, the Beatles were more, more presentable. Right. You know, they, they weren't... These guys, right? Yeah. And this is probably 64, 65. And, and you know, the mop top ha haircuts are still well, cute. Well, that's, that's what I was going to say. They're all wearing blazers, Not by to the contradict way. it, the but... The suits, Right. Because a lot of the uh, prior generation even didn't like the Beatles haircuts. They thought they were too, their hair was too long. Well, in my neighborhood, you were either a Stones fan or a or Beatles, Beatles fan. fan. And I was, I was a Stones fan all the way. Maybe second would have been the Who, if you're, I'm going to pick British Invasion bands. The, 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 the Beatles I really didn't get into to actually after I got a, out of college. I just started listening to their stuff sort of an, an academic type level in breaking it down song by song album once they were all on on cd because it was just so easy um okay so you have you have this incubator uh, this this hit factory hitsville usa motown that that literally i think it tells people anybody black or white you can have a hit record on the radio and you can become a star but it doesn't happen for the MC5. It, they, they, they get their debut album out, and it, excuse us if this is repeating, but on the death of their, uh, I guess it was Wayne would be their lead guitarist, um, they release their hit album, their debut album, and um, they put the uncensored version of Kick Out the Jams, mf -er. Plural, MFers. And um, it lands in the, the stores, in the department stores. And Hudson's, which was a major record store in Detroit, refuses to carry it. Um, so then it goes like wildfire all over the United States. Uh, they literally were blackballed, banned. Well, if I, if I know the story correctly, they actually, Hudson's actually put it out in their in their it was out lobby. for a little while and then once the fbi got involved and yep. enough noise to got involved yep. they, they literally just pulled them off the shelves and threw them away okay <laughs> yeah so those are probably very collectible right um not as much as the butcher block by the beatles but okay so are they a band that is only going to be appreciated once all the members are dead and everybody goes back and, and um, rediscovers them. Because I feel that that's happening right now. I think the only original member is Dennis Thompson, who is the, the drummer. They're all passed away. Wayne Kramer, if you place, look up his old bed, he died last week or the week before, was the lead guitarist. Um, are they only going to be, are they like a, a Van Gogh, like a crazy painter that everybody thought he was nuts? And then years later, he becomes famous because they get him. Is that, is that what we're looking at? I don't know. I mean, I always thought they got recognition, especially since I've been alive. Yeah. I mean, I could, growing up in the 90s with uh, bands that touch on more political subjects like Rage Against the Machine. Okay. They've always given them credit in yeah. the press, interviews, things of that nature. So you're, you have the opinion the Go-Go's should have been in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame before the MC5. Oh, <laughs> I didn't see that coming. <laughs> um, you, do you know I, what I'm trying to say? I know, what you're, I know what you're saying. Okay. I mean, but not 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 to slam on anybody or yeah. disrespect anybody. Right. I, you know, I believe a great song is a great song. I'm just not educated enough on the Go Go's. I, Vacation. I don't know. Did, did, we got the beat. Well, I know all yeah. the radio hits. Right. Right. 
But uh, did they have one album? Did they have two? Did they have five? I I was going to say they had at least five albums. Did they? And then uh, the lead singer. Belinda Carlo. She had a fairly decent solo Solo career. career. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I'm going to go on the side of um, the MC5, I think even once the the drummer dies, um, will get into the Hall of Fame. I predicted it here. And they will be looked at as uh, sort of a revolutionary uh, protest band that questioned the norms of society. And with that sentiment being so big and so powerful in our culture right now, they will be looked at, history will treat them kindly, a lot better than Hudson's did on the release of the new album. Well, I'm, I'm kind of curious. I mean, have you seen the clip of the set? I think it's in 1970 at, at Wayne State University. Wayne Kramer's like doing a one footed shuffle sideways on the stage. He looks like James Brown. And and I'm I, you're looking at this clip. It's it's out there. I'm like, is this sped up? Like, and did they mess with the speed? No, they're playing real time and they are literally just almost just not intentionally destroying it, just destroying their instruments just by playing them. No, I, I honestly, I don't recall seeing that one. Okay, look I it mean, up. Yeah. Wayne State University, it's a side view. It's shot side stage. Uh, no frills, all plugged in equipment, no backdrops. The crowd is just staring at them like they're looking at a freak show. But the energy level, I'm Ramblin' Rose, Wayne Kramer on lead view. Uh, Vocal. Look up that clip. It's all over the internet now. Um, I, and we looked it up at a little, uh, I looked it up for some show prep and I'm like, wow. I'm just curious um, the way, let's say, Malcolm McLaren, you know, meddled, whether you want to call it managed or meddled with his band. Yes. And deeply influenced their fashion. Yes. You know, a bunch of different things. Pretty much every aspect of the band. Yes. You think the MC5's manager, yes. being he was such a political I activist? Think there's no doubt about it. John Sinclair was a political activist, uh, a, a 60s radical, and he pushed them probably to be as radical as they possibly could. The, the funny thing, from what I've read in his book, uh, Guitar Army, he was more of a jazz fan, a Coltrane fan. So I, I think the MC5 went along with it to one point, and I think eventually they uh, they went their separate ways. His wife is a really good photographer, and she's got some of the best early 60s proto-punk photography images of the MC5 and Iggy that are out there because she was there. She was, you know, just following the scene around. Um, okay, so RIP Wayne Kramer. Um, the later interviews that I saw with him, he, just seems like a very humble man. And he actually, at, at the end of his career, did some things for prisoners. He, he understood the plight of being locked up in jail. And in, even in that punk uh, documentary, he touches on, you know, he did some stupid things and he got his ego got a, ahead of him. Um, and uh, from what I hear, they got a new album coming out. Bob Ezrin, I think, is a big, uh, he did a, a lot of Alice Cooper stuff, uh, has a MC5 album in the can. It was supposed to be out a couple of years ago. It is going to be released um, featuring Wayne Kramer. And I think even they got the original drummer out for a couple of the tracks. And then a lot of the younger guys, like you were talking about, I think possibly, what's a guy from Rage? Uh, Zach DeLaRoga. I, I, I don't know if it was him or the, uh, the other guy I'm thinking of, Tony Morello. Morello. Tom Morello. Yeah. yeah. I think they may have come out and helped out. I'm not sure on that. So I'll, I'll be looking for that. I think we'll touch on Motown a lot in this series, and we'll touch on MC5. We've already talked about Iggy. Okay, fast forward. Um, so Billy Idol. Um you know, mid '80s. We talked about him last episode. Shows up again a couple weekends ago at the Super Bowl. Tell me, is the Billy Idol insider fan? What, what's your take on that? At uh, ninety-three hundred dollars a seat 
for the pregame show that was at the uh, stadium. Hang on, nine thousand three hundred dollars. That's what was in the press. VIPs to see Billy Idol. To see B- uh, Billy Idol, but not one, but two thirty-five minute sets. So there were, there were two shows. Did you get to stay for both for that price? Or they probably kicked you out. And then brought somebody else in. Brought in a new crowd. Yep. 9300 bucks. Yep. How many people in the stadium? Like, is it a, like a thousand seater? Uh, I The um, articles I read, and I read at least three, if not four, they didn't specify how big the VIP venue really is in the okay. Las Vegas stadium. I'm sure they got more than one. Yeah. I'm sure they have one that fits a few hundred people. I'm sure they got one that fits a couple thousand. I saw one little – I didn't watch the Super Bowl preview, but I saw one little clip. He he actually looked pretty good. Um, you know, like anybody, he's put on a good 20 pounds, but he's not like morbidly obese or anything like that. He had some kind of wild sort of drop crotch MC Hammer looking pants on and some kind of spiky shoulder pad spaceman looking top on. I'm like, yeah, that's Billy Idol. Now, did he have Steve Stevens with them for the for these gigs? Do you know? Oh yeah, it's his band. It's his band. It's his band. He's had the same band for quite some time. They're really, I can't even, extremely ta- talented musicians. I, I, you know, like I said, when I saw him in, I think it was '84. I think I paid thirty bucks at the time. The the lead guitarist blew me away. That guy was that's a guy's incredible. He went on, didn't he? Do uh, Top Gun, the, the like the lead soundtrack, Steve Stevens. The title track the, of the lead, the lead yeah. of the soundtrack he yeah. did, you know, at the climax of the movie. Yeah, he yeah. actually won a Grammy for that. Yeah. So, um, so do you? So all these punk bands come around, and then whenever you hear them interview, they say, "Well, yeah, Biggie Pop and MC5." So they they cite these Detroit bands as their influences. And that, that's what cracks me up because I keep saying, you know, all, all roads uh, uh, go back to Detroit. I'm a little biased, right? Um, but then you're agreeing with me on 80% of this. Um, okay, so Billy Idol, um, are they, once again, are they, are they grooming him for the Hall, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? I'm actually disappointed, you know, he's not in it already. Right. You know, he should be in it. I mean... <clears throat> His, I, uh, his first solo album dropped around 81, 82. Okay. And there are people that have come out and put out a record after that point, and they're in there, or at least been nominated several times. Okay, let's try a little test. And between the two of us, we should be able to come off, come up with uh, 10 Billy Idol songs off the top of our heads. Uh, you start. Uh, we'll just give me one. We'll go back and forth. Oh, um, do we want to do cover? Do we count covers? Because he's had a few covers. Yeah, if they were a hit. Yeah. Okay. Um, the obvious Money Money. Okay. I'm going to go Tommy back. Uh, Sean Bell's cover. I'm going to go back to White Wedding. Uh, more recent years, Kings and Queens of the Underground. Interesting. Now that's obscure. Uh, I'm going to go back Hot in the City. It was a cover, I think, of a Nick Gilder song, but it was a Billy Idol yeah, hit. It was a hit. I think before uh, before uh, the other one I just mentioned. Go ahead. You're next. Sweet 16. Okay. Um, I'm going to say Blue Highway, a little deeper cut off of Rebel Yell. Um, his most recent radio play... Second to the last EP, um, Bitter Taste. Okay. That was kind of his big re-comeback. Not that it's his first comeback in the mainstream. but it's... Yeah. You, you, you are hardcore because I'm going to go back to the more of his mainstreams. Eyes Without a Face. Uh, Cage. Okay. Catch My Fall. Do you remember that one? Well, that's actually one of my favorite ones. I love that song. Yeah, it's a great song. Okay, you're next. Um. Did we say Dancing With Myself yet? No. No, there you go. It was probably his most well-known song. How about Rock the Cradle of Love? In my opinion, is best music video ever. Yeah. Do you it, remember that video? Yeah, I thought it got, I thought, I thought he stepped into the corny a little bit on that. I don't remember why, or I don't remember the details. Okay, 
I'm probably much tapped out there. Um, go ahead. Oh, am I still going? Yeah. Um, you tapped out too. No, I mean, I, I just don't know which one. Uh, I'm trying to remember what we already said. Um, oh, I got another one. Uh, we can do um, Can't Break Me Down. All right. How about just the song Rebel Yell? We, you know, there's the album, but the, well, that, it's the, true. So, the song was huge too. Yeah. It okay. Was. So here's the experiment. I say if two guys sitting in a, in a coffee shop could come up with a dozen. 14. If we kept going, we could probably get it up to 20. Yeah. He, he's in. Okay. Let's try this. Uh, go go songs. I gave you two earlier. Um, I'll, I'll do one. Vacation. Our lips are sealed. Um, um, <laughs> um, we got the beat. See what I mean? I almost yelled out a Bengals song, and I, I yeah. don't want to offend okay. anybody. <laughs> so I, I, don't get me wrong. I love the Go-Go's, and, and I'm, I'm happy for their success. So Billy Idol's in. Um, but, you know, you, we could do MC5. We would. I can only tell you two or three songs. I, it's not like I sat down and listened to MC5 albums. It just didn't – I didn't understand it. And uh, even when I got their greatest hits on uh, – because CD, I was like, okay. You know, it was like a angry thrashing. I, I probably will go back and give it a good listen um, after the show maybe even. Okay, let's move on. So we talked on Motown sort of setting the stage for, hey, man, you know, in, in Smokey Robinson yesterday's birthday, uh, he's 84 years old. Uh, Barry Gordy's still alive, 94 years old. Okay, so – they, they sort of set the template that anybody could be a star. I mean, in the United States, we knew that there was Elvis, but Elvis was sort of like a one-man controlled, uh, what is this, Colonel Tom that, you know, Motown was showed we can take anybody and put them through this this hit, Hitsville, USA um, star creator, and, and, and they really, really proved it. Um, and then we went on to uh, the MC5, which... I claim they're going to be in the Hall of Fame, um, and they will be remembered very, very kindly uh, with history for some of the things they did and said and some of the things they, they didn't do and should have done, and maybe, you know, they should be stars. Um, Billy Idol, I think, is doing a great job of his career right now. There's an unplugged clip out with him and Steve Stevens on the Internet I, oh, he did a whole leg of the tour like that. Yeah. And Not was, recently, but a few it, years It ago. was very, the sound was perfect, and it was very, very well done. So a props to him. Um, and then we move on to, uh, to some of the other stuff uh, that we did in the show prep. Um, we're talking about record collecting, and <laughs> I threw this out at our show prep meeting. And I said, what about Taylor Swift? I have no comment. There is an army of 16, 14, 15, 16-year-old Swifties I, I, I don't want after me. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I did some research on this. And, you know, my, my, my niche, 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 whatever. My niche is 45. So I, I looked up. Um, her 45s on Discogs, and she only had three official ones. There's like four or five bootleg ones. One of them was going for $500. So I'm, I'm pretty sure when that first came out, it wasn't retail $500. So what the heck is going on? She, someone said she's a billionaire, and that people, I did some reading, people are buying her vinyl, and that they don't even own turntables. They don't open it. They just collect the vinyl. I mean, what do you what? Do, give me your armchair guess. What 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 is going? Is this like a a female Elvis? Is that what it is? I that's a good that's one way to put it. I mean, 
I mean, even, let's be honest, even Madonna, people didn't, unless they were specifically her personal items. Yeah. Like, I've seen TV shows where they try and sell her old journal. Yeah. Things. We're not talking about that. We're talking about just mass-produced records, tapes, CDs. Correct. But, you know, and I'm, I'm probably, on my, uh, you know, I've got Detroit Bob uh, Vinyl Rock Mine on, uh, on Twitter. You could look that up. I'm probably subscriber to, you know, thousands of uh, other sites that deal with vinyl. But then there's this rabbit hole where you have Taylor Swift vinyl that they Don't are all wrong. I've seen it everywhere. You yeah. walk into Target, she's got her own gondola yeah. you know, with her photo there. Right. You know, you go to independent record stores that normally don't touch, you know, a lot of pop music, but nonetheless, they have her albums there. Can you tell me one of her songs? <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying... Shake It Off? Okay. Well, um, I don't know if I got the title right. Well, we I talked about this up. at show prep... Uh, I know 1989 was the name of an album. I I actually have a copy of the gentleman that covered that album. Yeah. You know, uh, Ryan Adams covered it. Right. And that's the only reason I know it. Yeah. And I thought it was a little weird at the time. He just literally took the whole album and just, just covered, covered it. it. Yeah. And actually, the, the, 19, the cover of 1989, uh, Ryan Adams' version of it, it's, it's actually a decent cover. When I finally heard her version of it later, I thought, oh, that doesn't sound right. But I had heard his first. So did he hear something in her that, that said, oh, this, this girl's got talent. This woman's got talent. I don't know. Or it, was he just infatuated with her? Or was this just like a, a career ploy? Or Maybe he was doing her a favor of, uh, you know, opening, getting people to listen who normally wouldn't listen to her record. Right. That's a possibility too. Okay, so and the only other there is um, our, my song, our song about a swinging front door. My daughter used to listen to it when she was a teenager in, in high school, and it was on one of her mixtapes. So th those are the only two that I that I know. But that being said, guilty uh, of calling my record store and said, "Hey, you know what? I save me." A copy of the new album and from a collector's standpoint i sort of feel that i should probably buy it I, I would be more interested in something she put out on a seven inch and just from a collector's standpoint okay um you're gonna buy that for 20 bucks and it'll be worth 500 dollars. i mean that would be sort of collectible wouldn't it yeah yeah okay yeah. so i don't feel so bad now <laughs> now that we've talked this out i'm feeling a a lot better. Okay, um, so we covered just about everything we wanted to cover. Um, I got some decent uh, records today. Um, this guy here, um, he doesn't have his name, but it's called Trusty Spot. It's here in the region, north side of town, and this probably shows up a little bit better. He was very helpful. Um, I was the first thrift store that we stopped at um, didn't have any records they only had um clothing so we didn't even go in the second thrift store only had 145 and i bought it for 25 cents um by some unknown artist the third store we went to was this place called trusty spot uh records and in tees and this guy he had a nice section up front and then he said oh i got some old stuff in the back and I love that because he goes, it hasn't even been sorted. So I started digging through it, and uh, I got the Beatles in a picture sleeve. Um, started seeing some prints, prints on purple vinyl. Um, some more prints when doves cry. Um, ZZ Top Legs, everybody remembers this, the video. I, I don't think I have the picture sleeve. It's pretty, pretty beat up, but very cool. Um, I like Dwight Yoakam. He was big in the 80s, and he started to um, come back with that sort of Bakersfield sound. Um, this is a great song, Guitars, Cadillacs. Um, whenever you see the old London label, a lot of times it's the early Rolling Stones. And out of Gary, Indiana, sort of Gary's 
version of Motown, VJ Records. And a lot of people don't realize before they had uh, the Beatles, they had another four-man group called Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. So the template was set there. But, um, you know, our regular episodes are going to be about collecting these things that come out every Friday. Here's some other ones that I got. Uh, Neil Young, Heart of Gold. Get Off My Cloud, Rolling Stones. Uh, you don't see this. You don't. ZZ Top is hard to find on their with their old stuff. Lagrange, um, Fog Hat, Beatles, early Beatles on Swan Records. She loves you, ZZ Top. Once again, and here's your buddy, right there. Good old Billy Idol, Money Money, the live version. And I have this. It's got a really cool cover sleeve, shaking all over live, and a great cover. Oh, I'm wondering yeah. how much money he made, uh, uh, Mr. James from. Yeah. Yeah, Tommy James and the and the Shondells. Yeah. He was probably just sitting back and collecting the paycheck um, because they have to pay royalties, right? Isn't that how it works? That's how it works. You know, so I don't know the exact split, but the 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 writer of the song gets a piece of the action. And the, the performer of the song gets a piece of the action. I think it's a 50-50 split, isn't it? Oh, that's not necessarily the case always. Okay. Um, you know, depending on contracts, whether they have permission to cover it, mm -hmm. that, there's a lot of variables. Yeah. Um, I was When I was talking about Motown, uh, I heard Barry Gordy speak on that, where um, the Beatles, I think it was on With the Beatles, uh, they called Barry and said, uh, we're ready to re release our next Beatles album in the U.S. And it's got, uh, it's got three Motown songs on it. And um, Barry Gordy said, well, the, you know, the going rate was like two cents per, per album royalty. And the English company, and I'm not sure which one it was, but the Beatles' interests in England said, instead of the two cents, uh, we would like to pay you only one and a half. And Barry Gordy said, no way, no way. And they said, fine, um, you've got till 12 noon um, tomorrow uh, or whatever to, to call me back. Uh, we're, not, we're not bending. And Barry Gordy sat on it, sat on it, sat on it, sat on it, sat on it. And at two minutes to 12 noon, he called them up. He said, okay, one and a half cents instead of the usual two. And then he said, later, he found out that the album had already been mastered, printed, sealed, and shipped. So there was no way they were going to pull those songs, but he didn't know that. But he said also he learned a valuable lesson. It's a part of something is better than 100% of nothing. So he said he learned a valuable lesson. Um, and I think the Beatles did very well, and Motown did very well financially on that on that little deal. So lesson learned. Okay, anything um, else you want to add to today's discussion? Uh, we brought up the Billy Idol band. Mm -hmm. uh, Billy Idol's um, other guitar player, Billy Morrison, has a solo record coming out. Interesting. Uh, the video actually drops today on the 20th. Today is the 20th, is it not? Okay. So would he be, uh, does he currently travel and play with Billy still? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's been part of that band for quite some time. So he would be the backup or rhythm guitarist that um, holds things together while Steve Stevens does all the... <laughs> um, I think they've gotten to the point where it's... I mean, not to call it a flat-out Keith Richards, Ronnie Wood combo, but right. they, they can play off each other at any point in time. Interesting. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. Um, okay, so upcoming episodes, um, you guys let us know in the notes what do you want us to talk about. Um, between Johnny and I, we have everything covered from probably big band to, you know, the latest punk, metal. You're pretty good on metal, aren't you? Uh, depends what you classify as metal, right. because the uh, 
yeah. you know, yeah, the yeah. inaudible demonic uh, yeah. lyrics. I, I just haven't gotten into. Well, I think I think we're, we're going to get into the uh, the second half of that punk series where, you know, all of a sudden, you know, the the hardcore punk where it was like the early Black Flag where there was no melody anymore. I think I, I like what emerged out of that, which was like your offspring and your green day and some of that stuff. It became, became very cool to listen to. Um, so I think we should touch on that too. Uh, green day. Um, yeah. You might say, well, that's not punk. I go, eh, definitely got some punk roots in there. Well, I mean, that was what they were known as, especially when they started out. Yeah. How about offspring? Offspring. Um, you know, I, I can only name so many albums. I wasn't the biggest Offspring fan. Yeah. But, you know, I got to give them street cred. Right. I mean. They, you know, they sold a lot of albums. Well, we got. Yeah, one guy say he was a janitor and then, then they had to. It's like, you got to give up your janitor job. And, I know the famous one is the singer because he's like a genius. Right. He's got, like he's got a, an IQ of like yeah. a bazillion or whatever he's it is. like a. a PhD in like some kind of advanced but science. But even Noodles, the guitar player, I mean, he, he's a pretty sharp cat himself. Yeah. You, know, you can tell the way he carries himself. Was that the one they interviewed in the punk? Yeah, and he was the janitor. Yeah. yeah. So that was very cool. Okay, so we'll move on. Um, we'll do another episode in about three weeks. Um, remember, uh, these episodes drop sort of randomly, but every three to four weeks. And uh, this is Detroit Bob, the podcast. By default, it'll probably be Johnny and I. Um, the regular episodes are Rock Mine, and those drop every Friday. I try to get them out by noon, and that's really where I zero in on finding 45s. Uh, this is culture, uh, music, and we open it up quite a bit to anything we see fit. And um, I know we've got a trip coming up. Johnny and I are going to Indy, and we're going to see Adamant and English Beats warming up. And then we're going to try to hit three record stores uh, in the afternoon before the show. And that will probably be a, a, an episode. Indianapolis is interesting. It sort of sits in the middle of the Midwest. And a lot of record pressing plants where there's Richmond, Indiana, there's Terre Haute, Indiana. Uh, RCA Records, I believe, was based out of Indianapolis. So a lot of these 45s, you see a little I stamped in the margin that was indianapolis rca records territory elvis if you remember was rca records rca victor the the famous dog next to the you know the record player yeah, yeah the gramophone so um i'm looking forward to going down there we'll do our homework uh about two months ago if you remember i forget which episode it was johnny and i went to chicago very successful trip uh with solomon where we hit hide records we hit sugar and then we hit that other one. Um, in, was it, it wasn't in Berman, Berwin. It was, um, I forget what it was called, but I picked up some good Beatles stuff there. So you guys can refer back to that episode. All right, Johnny, we'll meet again uh, in about three weeks or a month. I'll book the room. Um, I've got a, potentially uh, the guy from Trusty Spot might come on for an interview. I've got that in the works. Um, so it'd be interesting to hear actually from a record store owner uh, what their take on all this is. This guy seemed to be sort of like us, music junkie, you know what I mean? So it'd be interesting to, like if you just look at this guy, you go, yeah, that guy would probably own a record store. He's got the whole vibe going. So we'll get him on here. Um, all right, sounds good. We'll see everybody. Make sure you subscribe if you like this. Hit the button to subscribe. That keeps this thing going. If you're interested in having a piece of the rock mine, you can go on Discogs and up, uh, look up Detroit Bob. Uh, I've got my collection uh, for sale. And don't worry, I'm not giving up collecting records. I've just got to move some of it out so I don't become a hoarder. And um, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks for joining us. And uh, take care.